Hi guys and welcome back to another true crime and makeup time video. If you're new here my name is Zara and I post a new true crime video every single week so if you love makeup and you love true crime definitely don't forget to come back and check out my videos and if you have any cool case suggestions definitely leave them in the comments down below and I would love to do them for you guys. So today's case was requested by Lauren and oh my god when I saw this name that she requested I was like wait what? I was like, shit business. Is this a real case? Like, is this for real? So I had to like Google it. And then when I looked into it, I was like, oh, oh. So if that reaction tells you anything about this case, buckle up. Also, this case is fairly new, like really new. So more information may come out in the future. I'm sure it will. If it does, by the time this video is out, definitely please share it in the comments down below. Also, it is very graphic so youtube may bleep some things out so yeah just warning you guys be prepared and let's get into taylor shabidness shabizness okay so like always i like to start off telling you a little bit about the main people in the case like a little bit about their backstory but there's not much really out there about taylor as yet so let me tell you about her business okay i'll stop I won't do that anymore. <laughs> so Taylor is a 24 year old woman from Green Bay, Wisconsin, but records show she also lived in a few other places, San Antonio, Houston, and Suamico, and also Cochula or something like that. I don't know how to say that. And she apparently went to Howard slash Suamico schools. Now her last name, um, she business, I don't think that's her real last name. According to court records, she changed her name from Taylor Denise Coronado, and then she obviously changed it to Taylor Denise Shabiznes in 2018. So she's had that name for quite a while now, but I don't know where the name came from. And she also gave birth to a baby boy in 2021. So she's kind of a new mom, technically still. Her husband is also currently in jail in Wisconsin on like other charges and he was actually in custody at the time when this ca like case took place and according to facebook like posts from friends she didn't have custody of her child i don't know since when but it just seems like she didn't have custody of that boy her husband's facebook page calls her queen taylor she business and on it he had this like little quote he wrote I do trust my beautiful wife. I will do anything to protect her. Stay strong, baby boo. I love you. And um, yeah, it's like so random. Facebook gets used a lot in this case. They've been together since 2017. But he's apparently been in jail for a while. So I'm like, I don't think that baby boy is biologically his. So I don't know. She just got pregnant by another guy while her husband was in jail. Like, I'm really not sure what's going on with that like with her personal situation i mean maybe it was through like a conjugal visit but do you just get that i thought only like prisoners with long long term sentences get those so i don't know let me know if you know she also made a few posts on her facebook page back in january of this year 2022 and i want to read some of them so on january 13th she wrote on facebook i got hitched to show them my commitment loyalty and dedication to them that I was never gonna be how I used to be. They then turn around and fuck on me. There's no way I'll ever go into another relationship and then hashtag can't trust no one. So that was really weird because I thought she was married. Then the other one that she made again on January 13th said, went off and told an addict, I'll never stop buying you dope so I could sit back and watch you die. Like, I wonder if these are just like lyrics from a song or something cool that she thought she was writing it's kind of like so random to me so she does have a previous criminal record in wisconsin in june 2020 she was charged with battery or threat to a police officer and then resisting or obstructing an officer the records also show that she actually pled guilty to this felony charge and she was sentenced to three years probation and 60 days in jail. Then in August 2020, just like a few, like two months later, Taylor was again charged with bail jumping and resisting an officer. And she was also charged with um, 
like possession of drugs, drug paraphernalia, fleeing from an officer in a vehicle, resisting an officer again. So I think these resisting an officer charges, they're all like multiple charges of the same thing because she'd been doing this so many times. And in that second case, she was sentenced to two years probation. So not harsh sentences at all. And I mean, would you consider the crimes she committed harsh or serious? So I don't really know, but yeah, it's, she had like felony charges, but yeah, she didn't get a lot of repercussions for any of them. On top of that, I also did read that she allegedly had an ankle monitor on at the time this crime took place and that she just cut it off so that she could, you know, do whatever she wanted. And I was like, if you guys know, is it that easy to cut it off? Because, I mean, then wouldn't everyone just cut theirs off and just, like, keep it in their purse and pretend that they were wearing it? Like, I don't know. It just seems like why would they make it so easily destroyable that's not a word but you know what I mean now if she did have an ankle monitor that means she'd be on house arrest right or only be able to go to certain places like her job or you know I'm sure she didn't have a job she didn't have a job or you know to her like mom's house or something like that she wasn't really allowed to sort of leave her house that much was she and keep in mind like she still has like a newborn and I know she probably didn't have custody of him but when I was looking through her Facebook page, photos in November show him like as a newborn. So even now in June, July, he would still be like under one, you would think. So it didn't, I mean, was she going to visit the baby? We don't know. I really hope this baby wasn't in her care. And I mean, I don't believe he was because how else was she, you know, going around doing drugs, partying, doing her own thing. So and it didn't seem like this baby was ever, you know, reported to be neglected or abused or anything like that. So I think maybe someone else had custody of this child or care of this child. And I did see some photos of this boy on her Facebook page and he's so cute. So, and he looks fine and healthy. So I think, yeah, it makes me feel better knowing that he was being taken care of by someone. Okay. So that was a whole jumble of information. So let's recap Taylor. She business. She's 24 years old. She has a new baby. She's married. She's been with this guy since 2017. He's in jail for a while though. She's got multiple criminal charges. She's a partier. She's on drugs, substance abuse. And then she had an ankle monitor on, but she somehow got rid of it to get her party on. Okay. So that was Taylor. So enter Shad Therion. Shad was born September 7th, 1997 in Green Bay, Wisconsin to Tara and Michael Therion. Therion, Therion. He had two sisters, Ava and Salivia. And then he also had a brother named Bo. He was 24 years old and he apparently also went to Howard Suamico schools. I don't know if that's like one specific school or if it's schools in the area, but he also went to Bayport High School as a student from the years 2010 to 2015. However, However, on the website, he is not listed as um, having completed or graduated from like any of those schools. So I don't think he ever graduated. He later worked with his father and his grandfather in their family business. Shad enjoyed camping, games, and just spending time with his family. He was kind, compassionate, and he often thought of others before, you know, he thought of himself, according to his family. He was kind of an artist who loved wood carvings, and he also really loved music. On his Facebook page, he, he would always post, like, music videos. Now, at this time, Shad and Taylor hooked up. It was mainly a sexual relationship, I believe, and I don't know how long they were doing this for or how long they were together for because Taylor, you know, she has this husband, but basically drugs were involved and they were partying it up and enjoying life. But again, Facebook, they posted a lot of stuff because, you know, 24, they're kind of young. Taylor would post, you know, things about being in a relationship and how she's going to get you on drugs and do these things to you. But then Shad also had on his Facebook page, like cryptic messages, you know, talking about like a negative relationship essentially. Okay, so we are up to February of 2022 this year. Taylor goes to Shad's house. Well, technically his mother's house because Shad lives with his mother. So around 9.30 p.m. on 
Monday, 21st February is when Taylor goes to Shad's house. She arrives at his house and she picks him up in her car. So then they go back to Taylor's house where they begin their little party and they partake in some substances where not a exactly sure what but then for some reason they pack up all their things again and then they get back in taylor's car and then they drive back to shad's house and then once they get to shad's mother's house they go down into the basement and i guess maybe that's either where shad stayed or that's probably like his area where he was able to hang without being disturbed by his mom someone at taylor's um apartment building said that they actually saw Shad and Taylor smoking some substances on, you know, the balcony, as well as injecting some substances before they left to to come to Shad's house. And when they arrive to Shad's mom's house, she sees them, she says hello, she sees them going into the basement together. And she doesn't remember if they came back to her house that Monday night or really late that night, early into Tuesday morning. But that's when she saw them and then, yep, they go downstairs to party, do their thing. Okay, so now I'm just gonna warn you guys that it gets graphic now, okay? So now it's February 23rd, nearly two full days later. Shad's mother, she wakes up at around 2.30 a.m. She thinks she hears someone leaving the house and she hears like the storm door slam and together with this she also hears a car like driving away so she just assumes the woman at her house taylor had just left you know finally and she goes downstairs just make sure everything's okay and she sees that a light was left on like in the basement so she thought that maybe her son you know had left with Taylor and they just left this light on or maybe he was still downstairs so she just goes to see if he's still there if he's left whatever she'll turn the light off like she'll just go investigate basically so she goes down into the basement she looks around walks around she calls out Shad's name he doesn't respond so she's like okay whatever and she heads back upstairs now as she's about to go back upstairs she sees this like black plastic bucket at the bottom of the stairs that she had never seen before she's like like I don't own this bucket and this bucket also had a blanket over it like covering the opening of the bucket so now she was curious she was like what is this bucket (sighs) so she walks over there opens up the blanket looks inside the bucket and she finds her son's face staring right back up at her. Can you imagine her reaction? Because I, 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 I can't. So obviously she calls the police immediately and tells them, you know, you need to come to my house like right now. And the police arrive at around 3.30 a.m., which is quite late, but, you know, maybe she had to explain the situation. So when police come, it's stated that they find blood everywhere. And I'm like, if there was blood everywhere, why didn't the mother see it? But maybe she wasn't really looking for it. Like she was probably like half asleep, not really aware of what was going on. So police then locate this human head in the home, her son's human head. And they see that a towel had been placed over the bucket, over the head. And then they can see that the head had been severed from the neck. And apparently they could also tell, I mean, they're this is the expertise, that they could see evidence of strangulation taking place on this head. So what I'm guessing by that is that there probably was some of like the neck left on. So also located in the same bucket was a male organ, body fluids, and two knives. A further search of the property found this like tote and inside the tote, like a handbag, like a bag, um, inside the tote was like the upper part of Shad's torso. Like, now the upper part of the torso, so like this part, um, had a ton of like rigid cuts on it. And it also indicated that that's where, I mean, obviously, but that's where the head was 
separated from the body and that's why there were so many like rigid cuts around that area because the person doing this was attempting to cut it and possibly was failing. Also in this tote was a carving knife and several internal organs which were removed from the body and placed in this tote and then other body parts were found around the basement in different bags along with plastic sh like like they were just found in like plastic shopping bags and knives were also found you know around the apartment like three I think of them along with a bread knife and these knives obviously just looked like kitchen knives they weren't like specifically weapons like they were from the kitchen police also found like a significant blood staining on the mattress that was in the bedroom which they say appeared to be like it was being cleaned up from concrete but I think what they meant is that the it was on the mattress but the blood came through the mattress onto the concrete below because it doesn't make sense the other way around to me and evidence obviously of drug use was found in the apartment including a glass pipe and then also white powdered substances and then blood was also found in the shower and in the bathroom in the basement now police are obviously questioning tara and they're like what the hell happened and she's hysterical and she tells police well the last pe uh, person that i saw or that would have seen my son alive with and that i saw my son alive with was this woman taylor she says you know taylor picked up my son the Monday night at around 9 30 p.m they went you know to her apartment and they came back here and that's the last time I saw them she says she saw them going into the basement like late Monday night early Tuesday morning and then she heard Taylor talking the morning of the Tuesday like during the day and then she also saw you know a minivan that was parked outside but she wasn't sure if that was Taylor's vehicle since she had never seen um, what car they actually arrived to her place in. And I don't even know how the mother is like giving any of this information. She would have literally been so distraught. I can't even imagine seeing a family member like that. And I do not want to. So the police are like, okay, let's go to Taylor's house. She's the last one that has seen this boy alive. So they drive on over to Taylor's house and they like find her car there. The minivan turns out to be Taylor's. So the police, like, instead of going straight to Taylor's, they look inside the car first and they're, like, investigating the van. As they're doing that, Taylor comes out of her apartment and she, like, walks on over to the van and then she sees the officers and then she stops. Now, Taylor, she comes out. She looks at the cops. She looks clueless. Like, she doesn't look stressed. She doesn't look worried. Nothing like that. But she walks out. And she has just dried blood all over her sweatshirt, all over her hands. Her sweatpants are covered in blood, like no big deal, just blood everywhere. And she just walks out to the officers like, hi, she doesn't even, she doesn't even get it. Like she didn't even wash her hands. It had probably been hours at this point since she left the home and she didn't even wash her hands. There was blood all over her hands. So then an officer, you know, sees Taylor and goes, do you know why we're here? And she's like, yeah, because of the warrant for like my drugs, you want to arrest me for the drug charges. No clue. But anyway, so when they search Taylor's van, they go inside, they find a crock pot. Yes, a crock pot. So this crock pot was in the back passenger seat on top of like a laundry basket. And inside this crock pot, they found additional body parts of Shad. And somehow in this crock pot, she fit his legs. I, I don't know how. I, I've never seen a crock pot that big, but she fit body parts, including his legs. Taylor, you know, was then obviously taken back to the police department and she visibly had scratches and stuff on her arms and cuts. When the police tell Taylor, like, look, we found Shad's head at his mother's basement. And Taylor's response was like, that's pretty fucked up. <sighs> okay. Taylor then says, yeah, she left the rest of the body in his basement. When asked by the detectives, you know, what happened? She replied that she didn't know and that she had blacked out. 
when she was being interviewed by detectives and they were telling her like, you know, how they found everything and, you know, Chad's mother had found it, called them. And that's how they discovered like the scene in the basement of that house. Taylor's response was like, damn, the head. I can't believe I left the head though. And then the police ask her like, okay, well, where is the rest of Shad's body? Taylor's response was that the police, they're going to have a lot of fun finding, you know, all the organs and the body parts because she had dismembered his body. Taylor then goes on to tell the police, you know, I planned on bringing all of his body parts back with me, but then I got really lazy and I ended up only just taking his, you know, leg and foot and little bits of his organs in the crock pot with me. Like I ended up getting you know, pretty lazy. So this is Taylor's story of what happened that night. Taylor says her and one of her friends went to Shad's house that night to pick up Shad. They then went back to Taylor's apartment where they smoked and they did so then her friend then left and then when her friend leaves that's when taylor then shoots up shad with trazodone and trazodone is basically like an antidepressant it would improve your mood your energy levels your appetite levels so after you know doing this drug they then drive on back to shad's mother's house go down to the basement she says when they were in the basement that's when Shad takes out a chain and he puts it around his neck. Taylor then says that once he does that, they then began having sex. And the strangulation, you know, the, the chain was part of the sex act and Taylor and Shad had engaged in this several times before. She told police that they actually had two chains. One was like a silver chain link and one was a dog collar. And there were two of them um, and one was meant for Taylor and one was meant for Shad and they were like a dog choke collar. So they were into that. So they then began having sex and as they were having sex, Taylor states that she got so turned on that she just went crazy. She began strangling Shad using this dog choke collar and she just began pulling and pulling and pulling. She said she could feel Shad's heart beating as she was choking him and it wasn't enough, I guess. So she just kept pulling and pulling and pulling and choking him. But she's saying that Shad just wouldn't die and he kept rebuilding into muscle. And I don't know what that means, but that's what she said. And then Taylor just says basically, yeah, she just kept on and on and on doing this until the moment she realized that Shad had finally died because he started bleeding out of his mouth and then his face turned purple. She said even though this happened, she continued choking him with the dog collar and after he died, she continued playing with Shad's body and performing sexual acts on him. Okay. She starts describing to the detectives how she watched Shad die. And, you know, when the detectives question, like, is that what you wanted? Her response, like, in this, like, low tone was like, yeah, I liked it. And she states that the reason why she continued choking him is because she was already this far in the process. So Taylor then tells detectives that it took him around, like, three to five minutes to die. And she just wanted to see what was going to happen next. She stated that she really enjoyed choking him and she even asks the detectives like, do you know what it's like to love something so much that you just want to kill it? She states that, you know, after she did this to Ch Chad, while his mother is upstairs, by the way, she played with Chad's body for like two to three hours, like played with his body parts and performed acts on his body parts, used a toy on his body sex toy the same body parts that she later cut off and put into a bucket with his head she says she spent all day tuesday with um his body and then she began dismembering him that night that tuesday night and she continued to do it into wednesday morning so basically this took place like right away look how shiny this lipstick is it's crazy 
Um, yeah, basically she did this pretty much as soon as they entered the home and they came, you know, late Monday night into Tuesday morning, like late in the night, really. So she spent the whole of Tuesday with him doing that, like while he was dead. When she was asked how she dismembered Chad's body, she said she went up to the kitchen and grabbed some knives. And she said that she found that a bread knife worked the best because of the serrated blade, was able to cut through bone. Wow, like how sharp was that bread knife? Like, is that how sharp a bread knife is? That's insane. She said while she was cutting up his body that she became paranoid and lazy and that she believed it was the dope that was making her feel that way. And she tells the police, like, you know, I didn't mean to kill him, but I did enjoy choking him. I do not understand how the mother was upstairs the entire time while she did this. Like, choking someone, I'm guessing you don't make any noise, but, like, she didn't check. I mean, she probably just left her son alone. You know, he's an adult, but, like, I don't even know how she would feel knowing that that was happening the whole time while she was in that house. Did Taylor come upstairs to grab the knives? I'm pretty sure she would have. Like, imagine if her mother, like, gave, I don't know. I doubt her mother gave the knives. But, you know, if her mother saw her, like, maybe she didn't. She came in the middle of the night. Like, it's just so, so crazy. So, I mean, that's, you know, sort of what we know so far. And um, she claims she was high on drugs during this. Taylor has been charged with first degree murder, intentional homicide, mutilation of a corpse and third degree sexual assault. I wonder why it's third degree assault. Is it because he was not alive? Taylor's first court appearance was on March 1st, 2022 this year. And the DA said, I think the facts alleged are extremely concerning and disturbing and go to the extreme violent nature and grave nature of the offense. Prosecutor said that she is a flight risk and she already was on like electric ankle monitoring, part of probation from like one of her 2020 arrests. But somehow she was, you know, she managed to cut off this GPS tracker and she obviously cut this off prior to this crime taking place. The prosecutor state that this was one of the most serious offenses that have taken place in that county in a while. Taylor is currently being held at Brown County Jail on a $2 million bond. A psychologist that was hired by the court actually examined Taylor and determined like, yep, she's fit to stand trial. But the defense then wanted to hire their own psychologist, right? So then they ended up doing that. But then the psychologist that the defense hired couldn't actually determine whether Taylor was fit or not to stand trial. Like they couldn't actually come to that conclusion. Ultimately, the judge decided that, yep, Taylor is mentally healthy enough and, yep, she is fit to stand trial and she will go up for trial. So when I was doing more research into, like, drugs and stuff, it's been stated by many experts that meth can actually make people go, like, turn very violent and commit violent acts. The psychologist, the one that was hired by the prosecution, stated that she knew that Taylor had done illicit drugs. But she actually stated in court that there were no signs that Taylor had been, you know, distracted by hallucinations or, you know, other effects of regular drug use. And I think what she meant by that is not at the time of the crime, but maybe after the crime, like now they're interviewing her, they're figuring out like what Taylor's like and stuff like that. And her demeanor and behavior didn't show that she was like permanently affected by hallucinations or other side effects from doing illicit drugs for so like such a long period of time it's also been alleged that taylor was obsessed with serial killers and especially jeffrey dahmer but there's no direct evidence of her actually stating this but a longtime wisconsin journalist he said he's done his research and he's spoken to like you know unknown like well, sources that he refuses to name and he also suggests that the crime that Taylor committed is remarkably similar to the crimes committed by Jeffrey Dahmer that, you know, Taylor has an infatuation with Jeffrey and her crime was so similar to that. So is she a wannabe serial killer? Like, I feel like that's a bit far-fetched a little bit. So till date, there are a few things that we don't know about this case. So we don't know exactly how long Shad was dead for, like the time of his death exactly, why Taylor was free out enjoying her life with Chad on that day despite her obstruction charge you know what motive Taylor even had to kill Chad 
to dismember him or what role the drugs played in this crime. We also don't know whether the details that Taylor, like the details of the crime that Taylor decided to share with the police is accurate. However, obviously, like with forensic evidence and things like that, I'm sure they can find some sort of correlation. And a police officer did say that the things that she's saying are consistent with what evidence they are finding. So I guess it will. I mean, it's a dismembered body. I'm guessing it's going to take a while to piece everything together, literally. So, I mean, yeah, this case is ongoing, but I just thought it's so new. It's so fresh. And then, you know, Lauren requested it. I said I was interested in it and I want to find out more about it, not only because of the gruesome crime that took place. I just think it's such an extreme crime for someone who's never committed a crime like this before. And I think it's in, it's an interesting case because most likely it looks like they're going to blame it on the drugs or they are blaming it on the drugs that they ingested. Some people are saying that, you know, mixing these types of drugs and things like that can cause people to go into a psychosis, be unaware of their actions. They don't know what the hell they're doing. I mean, is that what happened here? She was out on house arrest, yes, but I mean, it was for drugs. I don't think people would think that she could ever commit a crime like this, you know? I mean, drugs are drugs. We don't know the effects of them. Even though they tell you what the side effects are, we don't know how it's going to react to each individual human being. And I'm talking about chemical drugs, not like natural drugs, you know what I mean? Man-made drugs. And it's scary, man. Like we as humans, we ingest these drugs, like not knowing what the hell's really in them. We don't know what the cause and effect could be to our individual bodies. Even if you've taken it like a million times before, you just never know what, like when the next time this drug will not work for you. And then mixing drugs, like you just don't know what you're doing really. But then the argument can be made, well, we take drugs blindly that doctors prescribe us. Those are chemical, you know, man-made drugs most of the time. And we're taking them and trusting these doctors and they may not know the combination and, you know, things like that. There's a lot of like arguments that could be made in relation to drugs alone. And it's actually crazy. And I don't want to disrespect anyone, you know, or anyone that I know, but I actually know someone who used to take drugs recreationally and it wasn't a big deal. Like it wasn't that serious. And I know drugs are serious. I'm not saying that they're not, but at the time, you know, like we were in our early twenties and it wasn't like a big deal. Um, I didn't, but like I would be around them and I was like, I was cool with it. But my friend ended up dying from the same drugs he was ingesting for years at that point, the exact same drugs. And we don't know what went wrong, but one day his body just didn't react the same way it had been reacting. And, you know, he was fine in the night. The next morning he just didn't wake up. So it's really, really, really scary in that aspect. And I guess like we just never know. So we don't know what Taylor, like what the mix did to her. And Chad, even? What do you guys think? Even if she was obsessed with like Jeffrey Dahmer or serial killers, you know, whatever. I mean, what am I doing researching cases like that, like this? What are you guys doing watching cases like this? Does that mean we're going to commit crimes like that? No. Her history definitely involved drugs. And I feel like, yeah, maybe she should have been monitored more. Like those ankle monitors shouldn't be so easily removable. And I mean, I don't know how it works. So correct me if I'm wrong. But I think this was different. I feel like maybe she never done this combo of drugs before. Is that a thing? Maybe it brought out something different. I'm not defending what she did. What she did is wild, but I'm just trying to think like, but she, then she did say she enjoyed it. So that's kind of like the, like the fine line of like, wait, what? Also, I just don't think I could ever cut up a body. Like I could never, no matter how high, no matter how scared, I just don't think I could do it. Like I would just be the whole time. Like I can't. And how long do drugs actually last in your system? Is it different? Because was she high the whole time cutting the body up? Or is she just like sobering down and then she's like, oh yeah, I'm still enjoying this. That's where I think that's something that should also be taken into account. Her poor, poor baby boy. I really hope he's well taken care of. I really do. I hope he's with a loving, sweet, caring family. And Shad's poor, poor mother. How will she ever get over this? Shad's entire family. Seeing her son like that, it's going to haunt her for the rest of her life. I don't think she's ever going to get over that. There is a GoFundMe for the family, I think, to help with Shad's funeral expenses, something like that. It might have already taken place, but 
you know, you can always help out a family. So I will link it below if you guys are interested. This case is wild, wild, wild. So I don't think I would have ever come across it if no one suggested it. So thank you, Lauren. And let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, guys. I hope you enjoyed today's video and I will see you in the next one. Besitos. Bye.